The title today that we are focusing on is the scourge of biological innovations in Africa. And I'm going to focus more on what Kabi has done uh, to contribute to risk assessment, uh, prioritization, management, and communication, uh, majorly in the countries of Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, but before that, maybe I may need to introduce to those who do not know who Kabi is, who we are. Uh, Kabi is an international non for profit member based organization, and our remit is to improve people's lives by providing information and applying scientific expertise uh, to solve prob uh, problems majorly in agriculture uh, as well as the environment. And uh, we basically help farmers to grow more uh, and lose less of what uh, they produce, uh, combating the threats uh, that uh, our culture faces uh, and the environment, uh, majorly from pests and improving access uh, to scientific knowledge, which they can use uh, to produce. Um, we are globally represented, as you might see, uh, on all the continents with the more than uh, 450 staff across 26 uh, locations worldwide. So our major areas of expertise is crop health, uh, development, communication and extension, uh, digital development, invasive species, uh, publishing, as well as value chains and trade. Um, I'm not going to go into the details of this, but our major focus today as part of this seminar is on uh, invasive species. Um, so we recognize the urgent need for action. Kabi has, uh, over the years, more than 100 years, uh, worked around the world tackling issues that are concerning invasive species. One, to develop practical ways to tackle these, some of these threats, but also uh, to produce knowledge and tools uh, and resources that provide information on how do we prevent, uh, how do we detect, and of course, uh, uh, ensuring that we manage these outbreaks. Uh, but before, uh, probably before I delve deeper into uh, what we're doing, maybe we may need to understand a few uh, definitions that we might be important uh, in the course of this uh, presentation. And first, uh, we need to understand what an alien species is. Um, alien species is any species that is introduced outside its natural past or present distribution. Um, however, an alien species becomes invasive if its introduction, its introduction uh, has an effect on biological diversity. And some of these could be referred to as non-indigenous, non-native, or even uh, exotic, exotic species. So now, in phytosanitary terms, uh, any invasive alien species is actually a pest. Uh, and uh, by definition, according to IS, uh, ISPM number five, any species, strain, or biotype of plant, animal, or pathogenic agent, in general, to plants or plant products, is a pest. Now, pests can be categorized into those that are regulated, but also those that are not, uh, the non quarantine pests. Regulated pests are of two types. We have the regulated non quarantine pests, which are actually non quarantine pests. Uh, but to, whose presence in uh, in products such as transport planting might affect the intended use. The other type of regulated pests are the quarantine pests, um, which is a pest of economic importance in the area that is endangered, so it may be present uh, or not yet present. Uh, and if it is present, it is not yet widely distributed, and therefore uh, it is officially uh, controlled or is under official control. Now. So having uh, those definitions in the background, we, we are all very much aware of all these problems that we faced in Africa. We know the effects of Spodoctra frigipeda, the fall armyworm, uh, Pteromia absoluta, uh, which is the tomato leaf miner. Uh, currently, Eastern Africa is facing a big problem with the par of Paracoccus marginatus, the, pa the papaya mailbag. Um, most of Eastern Africa currently has potato cyst nematode, that's the Globodorus toscensis. Uh, currently in Kenya, uh, they are grappling with the effects of uh, uh, Pomesa uh, caniculata, the invasive uh, snail. Uh, some years back, uh, most of Eastern Africa had biggest problems with the, the methyl necrosis, which is caused by methylcrotic motovirus, in addition to some other uh, viruses. Um, Prosophis juriflora is the replacing many, many landscapes in Eastern Africa. Our well, Parthenia mistrophorus is also moving very fast in most of Eastern Africa. Um, we've had, of course, the water hyacinths on Lake Victoria, 
uh, Opuntia stricta that is affecting so much of the livestock in Laikipia in Kenya. And of course, the giant Salvinia, Salvinia molesta, that is affecting most some of the, the lakes in, in Zambia. But there are so many other invasive species. For instance, currently, uh, we are having the issue with the Rastocrocus uh, uh, invadent, the, 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 the mango milbug, uh, uh, and some of the rest. So, how are they introduced into these countries? One, of course, uh, they can come through natural mechanisms. Uh, but majorly, most of them come through human-mediated activities, some of them which could be intentional, while others can be unintentional. Uh, and some of the intentional introduction, of course, include when you bring in uh, things that are brought into countries as food or game. Some are brought in for environmental enhancement, especially most of uh, uh, the ornamentals. Some are introduced for biocontrol. Uh, others are introduced for conservation. Uh, and others are brought in for research. Uh, and in, uh, unfortunately, sometimes they might escape uh, into the environment, uh, ending up becoming invasive. So why do we have so many of these in sub-Saharan Africa? Of course, one, the borders are very porous. And of course, that uh, eases is a movement of pests across borders and introducing them into geographical areas that they have never been reported or they have not been. But also, we have weak border biosecurity which of course also affects uh, uh, the way this can be contained in certain areas. Uh, there is inadequate capacity uh, by most countries to limit or even stop these kind of invasions. Uh, but also in most cases, even if the country may have capacity to limit these invasions, uh, they lack adequate information about the potential invasions. What exactly is on the horizon that is coming that they may put in place contingency plans in case uh, it, of how they can they can be managed. So most of these invasives, of course, create huge impacts uh, on our livelihoods. And that's why we need to have concerted efforts to, to, to limit their, their effects if they're introduced. Uh, but the most cost-effective way is actually to prevent their introduction. They have economic effects, for instance, reduce productivity. Most of these are vectors of pathogens, uh, for plants such as viruses, such as bacteria, but also for animals as well. They are parasites. And uh, uh, most of them will compete for nutrients. And this is the basis where they actually tend to, 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 to replace uh, most of the biodiversity, like we, we see in most of the invasive weeds like prosopis. And of course, the introduction can also create trade restrictions, uh, especially if you have been trading with the country where that, where that is a quarantine pest, or a pest that is under regulation. So that will affect your trade, uh, uh, your, your, your trade balance. And of course, there's also most of these have high management costs in terms of eradication uh, and control, but even uh, as well as management. So they also have some social impacts as well, such as loss of natural and cultural heritage, especially when they come and eradicate some of the uh, the, 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 the the cultural and natural uh, things that uh, most people attach to. Uh, of course, they have also economic impacts on communities. Um, they are very good at displacing and relocating and, and relocating uh, uh, relocating people, but also some of them can have a food uh, safety concern, especially when most of especially when they're introduced in new countries and there is indiscriminate use of pesticides, uh, which could, uh, could have issues with the food safety. There are also some environmental impacts, such as loss of biodiversity, and this could occur through hybridization, uh, but also in the indiscriminate use of pesticides can have effects on non-target uh, target organisms. And uh, of course, degradation of habitats uh, is another environmental impact and also reduction ecosystem services, such as the provisioning, the culture, uh, and the like. But also some have other effects. Some weeds are very noxious. Uh, some are phytonosis. Those are diseases that the pests can be carried across uh, human and, and plants. Uh, one, of this, one of them is the recently uh, reported nematode uh, of a Zipinema species. But also some can, can be zoonosis, you know, which are carried between human as well as animals. So, so this is the impact, these are the major impacts that we, we normally get from these invasions, which even ex explains more why as uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, we need to, to limit the introduction uh, or man, uh, whether stop their introduction or limit their effects if they're introduced. So, so, so the best way of managing, of, of explaining 
um, how these uh, invasions can be managed is by using what they call the generalized pest invasion curve. And of course, before an invasion is, uh, um, is reported, the best way of managing it is through prevention. And of course, uh, um, uh, uh, he, the, the, there are three major mechanisms uh, through which most of these investors can get into countries. Of course, one is through importation of a commodity. Uh, the other one is the arrival of a transport vector. And the third one is the through natural mechanisms. And those three mechanisms have six major pathways. So for the importation of a commodity, one of the ways you can easily introduce these, uh, uh, these investors is through um, release. And this is where you intentionally introduce an organism for release. An example is biological control. Uh, the second one is the uh, escape. Here, a commodity is introduced uh, for release, but unfortunately escapes into the environment. Um, and some of these are the feral crops and feral animals, which are originally uh, 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 domesticated and they become, uh, they, they become wild. Uh, the third one is through contaminant. Here you unintentionally introduce an invasive uh, as a contaminant with a specific commodity. And one of the examples here you can give is when you import seed that is carrying a seed transmitted or seed borne pathogen. Your intention was to introduce uh, seed, but unfortunately you've introduced a pest. So those are three, those are the three major pathways under uh, the importation of a commodity mechanism. The next one we talked about is the arrival of the transport vector. This is where across countries, you went with a vehicle to pick some things. Unfortunately, you come with some soil on the tires on the vehicle, and that soil is carrying nematodes. Uh, and you introduce or any soil borne fungus like fusarium or verticillium. So you end up introducing a, a, a pest in an, an area where it was not originally found. But the last one, uh, which is the natural mechanism, of course, there's one a path of corridor uh, where uh, um, uh, unintentional introduction via human infrastructure um, for areas that were originally not con uh, connected, such as when you build the bridges, uh, to connect some areas that have been separated in space and time, or when you build canals, uh, such as the Suez Canal or the Panama Canal, and then you end up getting the uh, introduction into other areas where they were originally not. But the major pathway for natural mechanism is unaided. And this is possible where uh, an intentional introduction via natural dispersal across political boundaries. This is possible for insects which can fly, transboundary pests like the locusts and so on, uh, but also uh, pollen, which could could uh, move in the air, carrying uh, which sometimes can be virus uh, virus infested, dust which could carry uh, uh, bacterial particles, uh, but also uh, uh, fungal spores that could be carried in dust spores. So you can get uh, introduction of pests via such a natural natural dispersal. Um, and they, of course, um, so, so the, the key pathways here to restrict, to constrict would be the contaminant pathway to ensure that the seed is brought in when it is not carrying any unintended organisms, and also to ensure that the, the vectors are, are free of foreign particles that might carry pests. But of course, the unaided pathway, there is no way you can manage that one. So when an invasive species is introduced, the attention moves away from prevention to eradication. And here you, you have basically a satellite a satellite uh, um, uh, areas where the the uh, the pest or the investment might be, and you can carry out an eradication program. But in most cases, the invasive will uh, uh, spread. So your 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 focus stands to containment, and here you basically have rapid increase in distribution and abundance of many populations. One of the key uh, um, objectives of containment, one, is to ensure that you eradicate uh, satellite uh, um, uh, populations, but also to, to stop the, pre, uh, uh, the spread uh, from uh, core populations. And this is the basis of setting up pest-free areas and areas of low pest prevalence. But majorly here, what you, you basically have to, you need also to know the extent of spread so you can know also how, how feasible our containment uh, might be. And of course, the other one, lastly, is asset-based protection. In most cases, the invasive will, will spread very fast, especially if, if it is aided by natural means, 
uh, by uh, power regulation, and it becomes uh, not economically justifiable to eradicate uh, even to contain. So the major basis here would be to manage the effects of the pest or the invasive to add to levels that it will not affect uh, the assets such as crops and other natural uh, 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 nature-based uh, uh, crops and plants and forests and the like. And uh, if you look at the first three, prevention, eradication, and containment, those majorly are managed by the National Plant Protection Organization of a particular country. While the asset-based protection, uh, much as the NPPOs still have a role to play here, especially in regulating non-quarantine, uh, uh, non uh, regulatory non-quarantine pests, this is majorly the role of extension, where they have to train farmers to ensure that they can uh, manage the pest to levels that it does not affect so much of their productivity. So, so, so this, are, this is the best way of how you can uh, address management uh, of uh, an alien species. So how can we minimize introduction? If I go back to prevention, which is the most cost effective and sustainable man uh, management option. One, of course, you need to conduct a risk assessment to determine which species need to be addressed. Uh, two, you need to analyze the pathways, which I've talked about, through which these species may be introduced. And you can do this through constricting the pathways, reducing and limiting the means of entry and spread of the pest or the invasive species, intercepting movements at border points, as well as assessing the risk of land imports. Then you need to conduct periodic surveillance to ensure that there is timely detection and direct response, especially this is when detection is more cost effective. And of course, this is what I've talked about above is only possible if you have adequate information about potential invasions. And there is so many ways in which this information can be generated. Of course, you can do strategic foresight. It could be um, uh, through um, uh, prioritizing risks, but majorly horizon scanning is one of the best used methods to generate information about potential invasions that need to be uh, addressed. And uh, maybe as a definition, what is horizon scanning? Basically, it is the systematic examination of information from many sources and experts in order to identify potential opportunities, including, but not necessarily limited to risks and threats that are associated with them. Horizon scanning can focus at three major levels. One, species that have not yet been introduced into the country, region, or in a locality. Uh, can, which can be described as the area at risk. So you can try to get, generate information about those species not yet introduced. Some situation, you may focus on species that have been introduced, but had not yet become established. Okay, so in other words, they have not yet formed what you can call a self-sustaining population. Right. The last level is where you look at species that have been introduced, they have established, but are not widely spread. So these are species that are very ripe for eradication and probably also containment as well. However, uh, CABI has conducted a lot of horizon scanning in some countries, and our major focus is looking at species that have not yet been introduced into any country or region economic block uh, or any locality that we describe as the area at risk, and that's the, what is presented in plate number one. And uh, this is possible through employing what CABI's tool, the horizon scanning tool, uh, which is available on the CABI digital library. And this tool basically focuses, looks at uh, uh, information available in the CABI compendium about pests that have been reported in countries, but not the country at risk. So the country at risk is the country that you are focusing on, is your country of interest. I might be interested in looking at pests that I would want to know which pests I have not been reported in Kenya or South Africa or Zambia. So the tool will look at what's available in the public domain about what has been reported, not yet present in Kenya, but has been reported in other areas which that country might be trading with. Now, lack of a record about a particular area risk is not confirmation for absence because there are also so many gaps in reporting and publications in some of uh, these areas. So 
So the tool will generate a list of those pests and the, um, it will give you a list of pests that uh, cause, uh, cause uh, bacterial pests, to give you viruses and viroids. It will give you information on nematodes. It will give you information on anthropods. Those are major the insects and the nematodes, uh, the mollusca as well. Uh, and then also, excuse me, information on phytoplasm as well. So then after you have those that list of pests, we design a criteria to, pro to, to prioritize which of these uh, pests can we take forward. In most cases, it can be based on the value chains of that the crop is interested in. Most of these countries they have major value chains, major crops that they're focusing on, which play a very big role in their economy. And then you might be you might only look at pests that are affecting those value chains. If I was to look at, for instance, Kenya, I probably I would focus on potato, I would focus on maize, wheat, barley, and see which of the pests that the tool has generated that basically affect those value chains. And then you subject those pests to a, a risk assessment process. And what do we look at here? We look at the likelihood of entry, okay? Where is this pest? Uh, is it neighboring countries? First, is it present in Africa anyway? And if it's in Africa, is it in neighboring countries? And if it's not in Africa, in the countries where that pest has been reported, what is the value of trade? Uh, uh, with those countries because that also can increase the risk of introduction of the pest. Secondly, we look at the likelihood of establishment. Is the climate suitable for this pest to establish in case it came? Are the hosts available? And here we look at uh, not only hosts that are planted, that which are domesticated or which the, the, the crops that we are focusing on, but also the alternative hosts also the wild hosts as well, because all those play a very huge role uh, in establishment. So after determining the likelihood of entry and the likelihood of establishment, then you look at what's the magnitude of impact, that if this pest was to enter and it was to establish, what would be the impact associated with the social economy? And here we are looking at uh, the uh, things to do um, with the management costs, things to do if it is attacking the crop, things to do with the loss associated with them, uh, and, and a number of other things that focus on social economics. But then also we look at the impact on the environment. Will it affect native species? Uh, will it affect keystone species, for instance? A keystone species, a species that is very, very important for the ecosystem, that if you were to remove it from the ecosystem, you actually you will destabilize that ecosystem. Uh, but also we can look at... Uh, the uh, the ability to manage the pest, uh, which might result in indiscriminate use of pesticides and the effect of those pesticides to the non-target species. So, so we focus on all those, and we we score this um, uh, on a scale of one to five. Where of course one is least and five is is, is highest, and then of course you have uh, a gradual increase in risk as you move from one uh, to five. Um, uh, in the interest of time, I cannot uh, demonstrate all the, uh, the details of the guidelines. And then we, after that, we compute the risk, overall risk that is associated uh, with the, with this, um, with the, with the, the, the pest that we are looking at. Um, one, risk is basically a product of livelihood and impact, okay? Uh, if uh, an event has a high likelihood to happen and will have uh, create a very huge impact, then it, that it has a very, a very high risk. So in this case, we take the product of likelihood of entry by the likelihood of establishment, we sum the magnitude of socioeconomic impact and magnitude of environmental impact, and we take its product with the previous uh, likelihood of entry and likelihood of establishment. So that gives us a score. Uh, that now we can use to determine uh, um, the uh, how dangerous uh, this invasive that is becoming a that might become a pest might might have if it's introduced. And here, basically, I give you an imaginary example okay, of uh, of uh, of some pests that uh, can be assessed. And of course, on the on the first one, that's the Mr. Tabasai, you know, sector. <laughs> we know it is present in Africa. 
it is present in neighboring countries. And because of that uh, proximity, here we are taking uh, here we are taking uh, an imaginary example of a country like Zimbabwe, for instance. Okay. And you see that because it is present in neighboring countries, the likelihood of entry into Z Z Zimbabwe from uh, the neighboring country is very, very high. And uh, we also indicate the likely pathway of how it might be introduced. And in this case, we are saying that it can be introduced via a contaminant pathway. I talked about those pathways earlier on. Okay, a contaminant, for instance, we know that Bemisia affects cassava, so it can come on cassava uh, cuttings. So the interest here is basically to bring in cassava cuttings, but unfortunately, it might be carrying eggs of Bemisia or even the insects themselves, but major eggs. But also we indicate that it can come in unaided. We talked about the path of unaided because Bemisia can fly. It can aid itself across the border. And the, uh, we give it a likelihood of establishment of five, which is the highest actually. Why? Because there are enough hosts in Zimbabwe for it to establish, and the climate is actually very suitable. And we talk about, we, we talk about uh, a confident, a magnitude of social economic impact of four, because, and here we, we, here it is quite high, because besides it, of course, feeding on the plant and the, sometimes causing the energy and the like, but it also a vector of viruses, which is its social economic impact are very high. Uh, and then um, we also have uh, a magnitude of environmental impact, uh, which is three, which was it, I think, which was put a little bit high, but uh, basically um, here we are indicating that it can affect native plants and it might have an effect on those native plants. Here we include the confidences, basically like high, medium, or low. It is basically to demonstrate uh, how confident this, the score was in the assessment. And we come up with an overall score based on the formula I indicated earlier on of 140. So the maximum you can get with our guidelines is 250, and the least you can get is two. But we normally take a cut of 54. Because at 54, and a, a, a pest or invasive species will have scored three for all for, for each and every attribute, and at a score of three, such an invasive can actually become very destructive. So in the end of it all, we get a suggested action. Okay. So for instance, yes, you've gone ahead to say to assess it. You've got a score of 140. So what can I do? What could, should we do with that score? So what after that? And we have quite a number of suggested actions. Of course, I'm going to talk about some of them, but some of them could be surveillance, conducted detection surveillance to confirm pest status in the country. In such a situation in a neighboring country, uh, before even I create any import control, I need to confirm if the pest is already present in Zimbabwe because it is in neighboring countries. And the pest that can fly, the, the best option before you institute any import controls through pest risk analysis you have to establish pest status. So surveillance for the first pest should be very important. But also other actions such as pest risk analysis, uh, conducting research and the like. So you can go ahead and uh, assess all other pests that the tool gave you that you prioritized, and then you can get all those different scores. And one thing you realize here is that for most of the bacteria, they will come in as and viruses, they will come in as contaminants because they are seed-borne or seed-transmitted. If the fungi, they might normally come in as contaminants because some of them are seed-borne, but others can also come in and aid it if they're not very far from areas where, especially if they're in neighboring geographical regions. Well, others can come in as store away. They're hitching a ride. This is very important, especially for insects which could, uh, uh, snails and, and, and the lake, which could attach on vessels, which could lay eggs on vessels, and then they're transported across uh, political boundaries as hitchhikers. So what next after prioritizing those pests? We've seen that we've scored them. We've seen the various scores they have got. We've, we've set our own cutoff. We decide that, okay, for these pests that have this, uh, this level of cutoff, they require action. And what kind of actions can you think about? One, you can prioritize them for pest risk analysis. And uh, uh, 
PRA is, can be pest initiated. We are looking for a, 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 a pest, a, the, the pest itself. There could be pathway initiated. We are looking at a value chain. Or there could be policy initiated where you want to come up with regulation. And the um, CAPI has conducted PRA is at country level uh, in a number of countries in Africa, but also at regional level in the East African community uh, last year, in uh, SADC uh, last year, but also in ECOWAS, where we've done this to ensure that uh, we support countries to come up with import control that will limit the introduction of quarantine pests, which are invasive, but also limit the spread of those that have been introduced in countries. Unfortunately, fortunately, CABI also has a tool, a pest risk analysis tool that takes you through the process based on uh, the International Standard of Pathocentral Measures number 211 to write a pest risk analysis report that can guide management options that will limit introduction and spread of quarantine pests, but also spread of regulatory non-quarantine uh, pests as well. So after PRAs, what other action can we do? We can prioritize them for surveillance, especially detection surveillances. And like I said, if a pest is present in a neighboring country, it does not make so much sense for you to come up with a PRA to regulate it. The best thing you have to do is first to establish the status of that pest in your own country. And then if you, you confirm absence or not known to occur, then you can move forward to come up with the a PRA to regulate uh, its uh, introduction. So and to regulate how uh, trade so that it's not introduced into the country. But also surveillances are very important, uh, especially if you confirm detection that it is present to delimit it, to see what's the extent of spread of this pest. That is, would now help you to contain, which we talked about in the pest invasion curve. But the best way to contain a pest, you need to know the boundaries of spread. How far has it spread? So that you can imagine one, you can manage whether it is feasible to do a containment uh, or even an eradication. And uh, this is the basis of establishing pest-free areas. A pest might be present in a country. It does not mean that that country can't trade with another country but it can create areas which are free of the pest, which are called pest-free areas, or areas where the, pest, the prevalence of the pest is very low, that it can be managed to levels that should not be introduced into other countries, and trade can continue between that country from those main areas. The other one is adverse pest, to a pest risk register. Now, uh, if you look at uh, the pests we analyze, they are in uh, hundreds. But we don't need to focus. Some of them, the, the risk is very low that you do not need for, to, 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 to put so much action on them. So those that you prioritize, then you move them into a pest risk register. Why? Because a risk is not static. Risk is dynamic. It keeps on changing. A pest that was originally uh, outside Africa, if it is reported on the African continent, the risk of introduction increases. So also the countries have to have contingency plans in place to ensure that they can manage that pest the, the moment it, it, it alights ashore on their borders. <laughs> then, of course, uh, we use this data to update list of regulated pests. And I talked about regulated pests of two types. One, the regulated non-quarantine pests, which are already present in countries, but their presence in seed may affect the, the intended use of that planting material. The second one are the quarantine pests, which are pests that are not yet present in the country or are present, but not yet widely spread and therefore are under official control. So those two types of pests are always in a, a, a list of in a list called a uh, list of regulated pests, which most countries have a need to update. Horizon scanning has been one of the key ways we can actually update this list of regulated pests. Of course, the other one is working with academia and national country research systems to identify priorities for phytosanitary research. For instance, detection methods uh, in case uh, the pest arrives, um, uh, looking at uh, vector interactions, because most of the, the pests are present in Lela, 
that have not yet been reported in Africa. Uh, we do not know, we know the vectors in other countries where they have been reported. We don't know those vectors in, in our own country, in our own countries. So there is quite a lot of phytosanitary research that can be done to ensure that uh, we generate information that is important for making key decisions, especially on regulating some of these pests. And of course, publishing uh, findings uh, to, for, for, uh, to, to be access, accessed by major key actors. And we've, uh, uh, we, we've published quite a lot of this work uh, that uh, uh, where we've done, of course, we've done this in Ghana, uh, we've done this in Kenya, we've done this in Zambia, uh, but also we are working on ensuring that uh, we provide this information. The risk assessment information is extremely very important information for trade. And, and that's why Kabi has invested a lot to ensure that we can bring this information closer to major actors uh, in the trade value in, the, in, in, in trade of various value chains. Yeah, so, like I've said, uh, Kabi has conducted the uh, horizon scan in Burundi. We've done it in Ghana. We've done it in Kenya. We've done it in Rwanda, Uganda, and Zambia. But maybe uh, going back a little bit on on, on, on surveillance. As avoidance for us involves a lot of work. It brings together so many actors. In some, uh, we need, of course, to 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 move to uh, areas of uh, where hotspots where we 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 expect the pest might be. Uh, collect samples, uh, take these through um, extractions. Uh, uh, if there are bacteria, you need to isolate uh, the problem from the from the plant, bacteria, uh, fungi. Uh, if there are uh, if there are viruses, you need to extract the nucleic acid. Most of these are RNA viruses, convert it into cDNA. Then move through the process of determining, uh, uh, confirming the the pest. Uh, using uh, uh, published diagnostic primers. Uh, most, of course, also you need to conduct uh, biochemical tests to ensure, to, to confirm that uh, the, what you are talking about is actually what you're expecting. Or we need to conduct uh, pathogenistic studies. We need to reproduce um, the phenotype uh, of the pest uh, uh, to confirm that it's actually what uh, uh, we're expecting. We sometimes also, not actually sometimes, we have also to sequence uh, the, the, the markers, especially back DNA backcoding with the 16S uh, to confirm that that's actually the actual bacteria. And we may use 18S, ITS, uh, Rubisco, depending on, uh, on which pest you are looking at. For viruses, we are currently looking at uh, employing metagenomic sequencing uh, to, to sequence a number of viruses actually in, in a particular plant. We want to try out this in Kenya and tomato uh, to see, because there are so many viruses that the tool gives us, we cannot do specific uh, uh, surveillance on each of them. So where we have opportunities to use the, the next generation sequencing tools that are available to our disposal, we'd like to, to try so that we, we can do discovery of, uh, of these pests on, 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 on a global scale. And then, of course, we, which is also cost effective and can help us to, 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 to weed out those that are not yet present and focus more on those that we see through delimiting uh, those surveillances. And for those that we confirm are not present through the first level of metagenomic sequencing, then we can institute um, uh, mechanisms of ensuring that uh, they are not actually introduced uh, in these countries. So based on the work that we've done, what are some of the major phytosanitary risks of interest of in Africa? There are so many. I can't actually list all of them here. But the major, of course, is Alea fastidiosa, um, especially the two subspecies, uh, POSA, which affects citrus, uh, as well as the um, uh, coffee, uh, and also multiplex, which is the more wide, uh, has a wide host range. Uh, there's another... Um, uh, subspecies of the Alela, which is Alela fastidiosa, subspecies fastidiosa, which you find more in the pears and the lake, which could be of so much interest to countries, the temporary countries like South Africa, uh, of course, uh, um, uh, Namibia, and probably Zimbabwe, and, 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 and the like. Of course, the other of, of interesting is Rastrococcus invadens, which is the mango milk bug, 
which is, uh, I think, was first reported in Rwanda, but uh, has uh, spread to Burundi and spreading a little bit more into Uganda and might spread uh, in other countries as well. Uh, the other one is Paracocas marginatus, which is the pineapple mailbag, first uh, reported on the far east coast of Kenya, but has moved internally into 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 Southern Africa. Now it is already in Uganda, and I think it may also be moving to DRC uh, as well as Rwanda and other countries. Uh, the avocado sandblotch viroid, uh, recently reported in Kenya, uh, is uh, um, also a very not a very good uh, viroid, especially to to the avocado uh, industry, which is one of the, the biggest industry currently uh, in most of these countries as well. And the potassium nematode, uh, Globodera rostonchiesis, and Globodera pallida, uh, originally first reported in Kenya, but now has been reported in Uganda, has been reported in Rwanda, and I think Burundi. It's really a very, very bad nematode that affects uh, potato production and is very, very hard uh, to eradicate. Fusarium oxysporum from a specific tribency, tropical race 4, uh, first reported in Mozambique. Uh, uh, no records of spreading across uh, across Africa, but is also another pest of uh, phytosanitary concern uh, to sub-Saharan Africa, especially to major banana growing countries uh, such as Uganda, uh, Kenya, uh, most of uh, actually DRC, uh, Tanzania, uh, Burundi, as well as as well as Rwanda. Soft rots, especially the species decay, decay that decay solanile, decay that cola, very, very dangerous in potato production. Uh, and so much needs to be done, establish their status in most of the countries. But also, Petrobacterium species, such as Petrobacterium atroseptica, uh, which is very, very dangerous. But also, new Petrobacterium species that have been reported, such as Pongabensis. Um, uh, uh, Peruviensi, but also we do have those uh, Pectobacterium species like Caratovorum, Brasiliensi, which are also still affecting uh, quite a lot of productivity in most of the countries. The pineapple mean bug, Bastafarin has Zarephilus, is another one, and it's associated the uh, vectors. Um, the tomato brown rugos virus, with virus, not yet reported in Africa, I think in mostly in Morocco and Egypt, not yet in Sub-Saharan Africa, but it is a very, very destructive virus for which uh, we, we have to be extremely very cautious about. But there are so many, <laughs> so many um, uh, pests of phytosanitary concern that we have identified uh, through Horizon, using our tools of horizon scanning, where, to which we've subjected to risk assessment and the results we have that the risk of associated with these pests is extremely very, very high. We need to ensure that we prevent their introduction into these countries. And if introduced, we can detect them early enough to ensure that we minimize their spread or even eradicate them or come up with the containment programs uh, to ensure that they don't spread. Now, lastly, um, it's about, uh, uh, with, I talked about the asset-based protection. Of course, as Kabi, we've, um, through the Action on Investors program, uh, and currently the plant wise program, there is a focus to ensure that uh, we ensure, we, we limit introduction of pests, but also uh, 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 support where possible eradication, or work with key actors to contain them to set up pest free areas. But uh, in the last 10 years, uh, uh, since 2011, 2010, 2011, uh, Kabi was implementing the plant wise program. And this program majorly focused on pests that are already endemic in country, those that are native uh, to these countries. Um, and the idea was to build the capacity of extension officers to be in position to, to diagonize in the field these pests and then offer actionable uh, advice uh, through plant, what we called uh, plant clinics. This program was uh, in around 12 countries in Africa, uh, which included Kenya, uh, Tanzania, Uganda, Rwanda, uh, uh, we had Zambia, Mozambique, Ghana, Sierra Leone, Ethiopia, um, and uh, um, uh, Malawi, 
uh, yeah. So, but this program, of course, continues to run uh, in countries under the leadership of countries, but also is currently being implemented in Burundi. So this program was basically focusing more on this component, the asset based protection, where the base is already present, widely spread in the country. It is not economically justifiable to eradicate it, to contain it, but basically to provide information to farmers so that they can grow, they can manage the pest to levels that will not affect their crops uh, so much. And uh, after uh, some years, of course, an impact assessment was done and it was reported that 79% of the farmers who went to plant clinics uh, had an increase of in yield of 79%. Over half of our plant clinics uh, recommended non-chemical inputs. And this is extremely very important because some of these chemicals actually do affect uh, do affect uh, a non-target species. But also they have, of course, issues to do with food safety, even to us ourselves. The incentive of the farmers reported an increase in their income after visiting a plant clinic. And of course, we ensured the gender uh, balance of ensuring at least a quarter of our plant doctors worldwide uh, were, were female. And on the left, what you're seeing is a plant clinic in one of the sub-counties in Western Uganda, Hoima. Uh, the, the, the gentleman on the phone is a plant doctor. Next to him is a plant doctor. And here you see farmers who have brought diseased plants so that they are they can be diagnosed and then they are given. And this, this doctor here is also filling in a prescription form for the farmer on what uh, they are supposed to do. So basically that, the plantings focus more on the extreme end of the of the um, of the pest invasion curve, um, the horizon scanning PRA are focusing more on the first three but major uh, prevention. And uh, lastly, uh, you can visit the Cabedicto library, and you browse the products which you can see on the top right. And in there, you are going to access a lot of digital tools from Cabi, uh, including the horizon scanning tool that we've used to to identify uh, pests and, of course, uh, assess them, and also the pest risk uh, analysis tool as well. But also you find other tools such as the bioprotection portal, the plant-wise plus knowledge bank, as well as the Cabi Compendia and, the, and others. Um, I think with, the, with those few or many remarks or presentation or notes, I thank you for listening.